One of my favorite natural processes to simulate has always been genetic algorithms. It's a very simple way to make a computer program learn to solve problems in an inefficient but impressive way, inspired by how life evolved on our planet. If you don't already know the concept behind genetic evolution, I'm going to attempt to explain it in an oversimplified way. Every living being on Earth has a unique set of genes, which define every aspect of the organism, ranging from physical appearance to psychological behaviors. In the case of a human, one gene could for example be responsible for the person's eye or hair color, but others will also be responsible for much more important things like the number of limbs and their locations, or the way the brain should be laid out. When a living being reproduces, it will pass part of its genes to its offspring, with a slight chance that one or more genes mutate, meaning that they change slightly. If such a mutation is beneficial for the organism, it will have a higher chance of passing these genes on to the next generation, and so, with every generation, living beings adapt to their environment. This concept can be applied to neural networks to train machine learning models, which is where the NEAT algorithm comes from but it can also be used for much simpler simulations. Today I want to try something out that I haven't seen much on YouTube and that's to simulate the evolution of a virus on a very basic level. As always, if you like this type of content, please don't hesitate to subscribe and help this small channel grow. And also, feel free to leave a like to show your support, that would be very nice. So the plan of this video is to build a small world filled with innocent test subjects and then infect one of them with a brand new virus that should eventually turn them into zombified killer machines. Let's see how it goes. I created this simple low poly terrain in Blender, which would serve as a base for our environment. I also modeled some trees and rocks and placed them on the terrain. I then added some houses for people to live in, and also added two hospitals to give them a chance for what's coming. Now, this is Tommy. Like every other inhabitant of this town, he has a health and an energy bar, and also looks like a me from Wii Sports, but that's not important. Tommy walks around and enjoys his life, until he gets tired, indicated by his energy bar shrinking. At some point, Tommy decides he has had enough of wandering around, and goes back home. If his energy bar reaches zero, his health will decrease, and if his health reaches zero, well... <coughs> to avoid dying so miserably, the inhabitants are free to visit the local hospital if they are not feeling so well. Now, let's start a simulation and watch the town come to life. Everyone seems happy and no one dies, so nothing particularly interesting here. Let's start working on the virus itself. Before I explain my virus implementation in the simulation, I thought it would make sense to spend some time talking about what a virus actually does, because even if they tend to make things unpleasant, I find their behavior very interesting. A virus is a submicroscopic agent that needs the host to survive and to accomplish its only goal, which is to create as many copies of itself as possible. To do that, viruses usually inject their own DNA into the cells of their host to trick them into rapidly creating copies of the virus, at the expense of the host. Even if their behavior seems quite simple, they are forced to constantly evolve to optimize their spreading and avoid being eliminated by the host's immune system. For this reason, viruses tend to have a very high mutation rate, meaning that there is a relatively high chance that some of their copies have slightly different genes than the virus who infected that cell. Now, let's implement a much simplified version of such a virus in our simulation. I'll start by permanently infecting one entity in the simulation, which is indicated by the model turning red. At the start, the virus will be very basic, meaning it won't have any consequences on its host. At the moment, the virus will have to learn physical contact to spread from one person to another. However, every time a virus jumps from one body to another, it will have a small chance of mutating, meaning it will slightly alter one trait in its host body. 
At the moment, these traits are cough rate, sweat and virus resistance. Cough rate defines how often a person coughs, which will infect everyone in a small radius around them. Sweat increases the chance that a virus spreads with physical contact and resistance allows a virus to stay longer in its host body at the cost of that person's energy. According to the concept of evolution, the beneficial mutations should last longer while disadvantaged mutations should disappear faster. To encourage mutations, I created a very simple immune system which prevents people from being infected by the same virus generation more than once. In this simulation, a generation is basically one version of the virus's genes, so every time a virus mutates, this new virus belongs to a new generation. Let's start the simulation once again. The virus quickly evolves to become much more infectious and more resistant and spreads very rapidly. It is important to note that for this experiment the people aren't aware of the disease and don't do anything against it, so no lockdown or anything. I stopped the simulation after around 40 minutes to have a look at the simulation data. This first graph shows us the amount of healthy and infected people over time, and as we can see, the epidemic curve is a sigmoid, being the spreading accelerated in the first half and slowed down in the second one. Now let's see how the virus evolved during all this. This graph shows what influence the virus had on average on its hosts over time. It shows that the virus relied on coughing to spread in the first two minutes before switching over to sweating for that purpose. I think this is because sweating is more efficient when most of the population is infected. Also, the virus resistance dropped after around 14 minutes. While I find this very surprising, this might be to conserve the host's energy and gain more time outside to infect people faster than they can recover. This strategy could be confirmed by the next graph, which shows what people were up to during the infection. And we can clearly see that after 14 minutes, people spent less time home. Okay, so that was pretty interesting in my opinion, but still no deaths, and more importantly, no zombies. Time to step things up. Let's first talk about what I mean by zombie. Currently, the only effect the virus has on entities are typical disease symptoms, like coughing and sweating, which do make it easier for the virus to spread, but I think the virus could be even more parasitic by completely altering a person's behavior. This is what you see in most zombie apocalypse stories, where a virus, or another parasite, turns its host into a monster that does everything it can to infect more people. I want to see if something like that can actually arise from evolution, by making it quite a bit easier for the virus to alter its host's behavior. To do that, I modified the previous entity trait system to include more traits, so in addition to the previous three traits, I added aggressiveness, movement speed, exhaustion tolerance and pain tolerance. A high aggressiveness makes a person chase and attack nearby ones. Movement speed defines the speed at which a person will move, where higher speeds cost a lot more energy. Exhaustion tolerance defines the low energy threshold at which an entity will go home. And pain tolerance defines the low health threshold at which an entity will go to the hospital. You might think that in order to optimize its spreading, the virus would just have to maximize all its values, but it will face the challenge of balancing energy, as it can't spread any further if its host is dead. It will be interesting to see if the virus balances all these traits out equally, or if it will boost just one or two of them. So let's start the simulation with these new traits and see what happens. At first, nothing particularly interesting happens. The virus manages to infect a reasonable amount of people by boosting its resistance and lowering other traits to conserve energy.
Soon after that, the virus starts to increase the movement speed rate to infect more people, but nothing too impressive just yet. At this point, the evolution has created a few very fast zombies, allowing them to spread the virus faster. The movement speed rate continuously increases, so this seems to be the virus's strategy. From this point on, all zombies have turned into inhumanly fast sprinters that cough a bit more than usual, and this goes on for quite some time. Yeah, movement speed is definitely overpowered. At some point, there are so many more infected people than healthy ones that the Usain Bolt approach doesn't work anymore. So something interesting happens. The fast zombies start to become much more aggressive, which makes them run towards healthy people at high speeds. And hospitals become very crowded as all the running around and getting attacked isn't so healthy. But there still aren't as many deaths as I thought. Here things start to settle a bit, so I stopped the simulation. Time to look at some interesting data. When looking at the infection summary, we can clearly see that this time the infection curve isn't shaped like a sigmoid and looks more like a logarithmic growth curve. And we can also see a few important spikes, which are related to very beneficial mutations, like the sudden increase in movement speed at the beginning and the rise of aggressiveness at the end. And another difference compared to the last simulation is, is the fact that the two curves stop being symmetric at some point and begin to decrease together at the end, which is caused by deaths. Now if we take a look at the average trades over time, we can clearly make out the first spike in resistance, the sudden rise of movement speed followed by a drop in aggressiveness, which then led to the resurgence of aggressiveness. I was surprised to see that this time, virus resistance seems to have been essential for the survival of the virus, as it kept on rising, despite the associated cost in energy. Pain and exhaustion torrents don't seem to have played such a big role, even if they increase slowly throughout the simulation and especially as aggressiveness starts to develop. The fact that virus resistance and movement speed could both get so high without the host dying of exhaustion doesn't seem right, so I'll increase their energy cost for the next simulation. If you want to take a look at the different entity states over time, here's the graph, even if I can't find anything too interesting in it except for the spike of people going to the hospital at the end, which is probably related to the rise of aggressiveness. This was already much more interesting, but I want to balance things out a bit more by limiting how fast people can move before getting injured and thus not being able to spread the virus much further. So I implemented that limit and started another simulation. Let's see what happens this time. The virus spreads by maximizing the sweating trait and this time movement speed doesn't seem to get abused like last time. It does rise over time but just not as fast. This time aggressiveness rises much earlier and so does pain tolerance. 
with this more balanced out simulation, people seem to die much faster, which is probably due to the higher aggressiveness of zombies and the injuries caused by too high movement speeds. At this point, the virus struggles to infect more people and so zombies begin to either recover from the disease or pass away quickly, until there's just the first infected guy left, who can't infect anyone anymore, as all the survivors are immune to the virus's first generation by now. The reason Patient Zero survived the pandemic is that we permanently infected him with the first virus generation, which was harmless and prevented him from being infected by newer generations. If we now look at the infection summary, we can see a weirdly shaped epidemic curve that rises very quickly in the beginning, but slowly falls back to where it started. This time, both curves decrease over time, as more people died in this simulation. Let's take a look at the next graph showing us the average per trade influence of the virus over time. As we can see, sweating was the preferred trait in the first half, before evolution decided that aggressiveness was a much better way to infect more people. Doing all this, pain tolerance increased consistently, and exhaustion tolerance started rising shortly after the aggressiveness peak, which I'm not sure why. And most importantly, movement speed never reached the same level as last time, now that it comes with danger. I also think that the reason why most zombies disappeared at the end was because as there were less people to infect, the virus couldn't evolve quickly enough to develop a new strategy that would allow it to conserve health and energy. If you're wondering why all trades drop back to their default value at the end, it's because every generation that came from a mutation disappeared at the end, and so only the first generation was left. Once again, here's the last graph showing the various entity states over time, and the only real difference I noticed was the sudden increase of chasing due to the high aggressiveness, which dropped when the virus started to go extinct. So what do we learn from all this? Well, I don't really know how scientific my small experiment was, as I don't actually know the advanced, more complicated stuff about viruses and epidemics, but I think that if a virus managed to gain control over the actions of a human being, aggressive zombies could become a reality, but they would probably move around faster than they do in most fictional scenarios. Now, this video is already much longer than all my previous ones, so I'm gonna end it here. I might do a part 2 if you want, so definitely let me know in the comments if that interests you. And please tell me what you would like to see in the next part. I was thinking of making the people aware of the virus and allowing them to react by fleeing from zombies and locking themselves up on purpose, but I'm curious to hear about your ideas. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like to let me know. And if you like this type of content and want to help the channel out, please subscribe, it's free and you can always change your mind later. At the time this video comes out, we're getting really close to 100 subscribers, which is awesome. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you on the next one. Cheers!